welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. So I'm looking into my computer screen, and I think I'm looking at my friend Will Armstrong. Actually, I'm starting to wonder if it's an AI-generated version. How can I know it's really you, Will? Come on. I I am a robot. Nice (laughs) to see you, Douglas. Maybe you should ask me to identify a bridge or a traffic cone. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I can't. I th- By the way, those aren't motorcycles, people. I'm oh, trying no. to identify a motorcycle. Those are scooters, goddammit. <laughs> That's right. Let's get really clear on what we're supposed to be finding in these recaptures. Come on. <laughs> no criticism to our, our sponsor's zap there, but uh, it is my own personal defect that I can't seem to to recognize a bridge. Is that an overpass? That's not a bridge. Is that a, is that a railroad crossing? I'm not sure. Right. That's right. Ugh. It's like, you know, those uh, test questions where they say, if you have to think about it too long, just pick an answer and move on. Right. You can't do that. You can't get into your account if you don't find the exact right boxes. <laughs> try again. Try again. <laughs> I think it's uh, on three, I think, is, is my uh, my worst score. Be like, try again. Please try again. I'm like, I'm going to get locked out of my account because I can't identify a traffic cone. <laughs> That's funny, Douglas. Well, here it is about almost 10 o'clock. We were going to get together about nine and uh, things kept happening. You were still in the studio having a little studio time this morning and, and trying to catch some art time in before uh, we met. I was like, well, I got time. I can... I can run over to the coffee shop, grab some coffee, a quick bite to eat. Art Show World, have you ever tried to do something real fast and then you run into Jack Charney? <laughs> so, I love him. He's uh, That was amazing. I, I have actually, I look for him every time I go to that coffee shop because we, we, our studios are in the same complex. But um, I, I look for him every time and it, it's been several months since I've seen him. And I was yeah. like, man, where's Jack? And all of a sudden, the one time I'm like, I got like... 30 seconds. I'm going to jump in there, grab a cup of coffee and and come back yes. and, and start to talk to Douglas. But you weren't man. able to go in and out incognito. You you, you run Dude, into people, you know, and it. Yeah. And I, I think and I only know four people here. I really <laughs> I, it's, I, I don't have any. I really I don't have any friends here. I don't know anybody. I just I know. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. My ex-wife and her partner. So that's two. My kids four. my wife. Uh, so we're up to five. Jack. Pam Caden, I know the the lovely uh, um, Jennifer Caven and, and her husband Reese, who I, I adore, and and uh, Allison and Eric Antelman, and that's that it. That sounds that's... like a tribe. This list keeps on rolling, man. I guess <laughs> I only know a few people. <laughs> I, well, I guess, but it's honestly, it's been uh, maybe three weeks since I've talked to somebody besides my wife and kids. So okay, it's been a gotcha. while. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny. We talk about it. Uh, La Quinta is coming up and, and our good yeah, friend yeah. Trey, who we're going to talk to again, uh, our second mm-hmm. partner, because I can't um, I can't I can't keep that thing down to an hour with uh, such a <laughs> <laughs> but it's too much to talk about. We still left a lot on the table. It was it was so many stories, but every story he told had such meaning. So, yep, we've got a great part two coming up today. Yeah, and I'm really uh, excited for you guys to hear with Helene kind of getting down into the social aspect of of the work as well. So mm-hmm. I love that. I love yeah. That part of it. So what's going on in your world, sir? How are you? Well, it's pretty good. I'm up this morning and preparing for uh, our, what's it called? Snowmageddon, they say, when we're going to like mm. gates of hell are going to unleash their weather wrath on us here in Minnesota. Snowpocalypse. All right. Yeah, snowpocalypse. They're saying it's going to be the worst blizzard ever in the ever. Twin Cities, ever in the Twin Cities. That's insane. Yeah, I was it talking is. to my brother-in-law last night and he was saying that like they pre-canceled school which is they did you know, they never do that <laughs> never never like, say it, well, tomorrow and the next day they just said blanket cancel for two days yeah usually it's like let's see what actually happens because you know they'll predict something and it might be a lot less than what they expected but nope they just cleared out the rest of the week for people yeah i have actually been living through that we had an impromptu spring break oh. winter break for the kids which okay. we all kind of wanted to kill each other at the end of really? it but so we had nice. okay <laughs> they have scheduled parent teacher conferences right on thursday okay. and friday and then you've got president's day on monday so yay uh it's production season let's have a five-day weekend uh, oh. they got two snow days on top of that 
They did. Two and a half snow days. So it's like eight days of cooped up kids in the house, not doing anything, trying to, oh my God, it was kind of a nightmare. I don't know. Just plug them in. Just get the extension cord and just put it in the back of their head. Just put oh. them into the couch. I, it was kind of a nightmare, to be honest. I'm, I haven't gotten I've any work done. I know exactly what you're talking about. That Their schedules never seem to jive up with our work schedules, with, with you know creating schedules, does it? Stuff like that, everything halts, and you just, you're just you a dad. Also, you, know, you have to focus on home. 14 yeah. and almost 13. Um, mm. You know, 15, 13 is, is what we're looking at coming up in a couple of months. But um mm. They're well into that zone where they don't like you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? like, and, and and I remember that age. The most inane thing will send them off into unstable hormones and mood swing. At least right now, they're not choosing to hate me at the exact same time. So at okay. least I've got like one ally that can kind of like roll their eyes at their sister and see. I'm like, yeah, you were doing that to me just like five seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you can't, I don't know, I just driving them to school in complete silence is starting to wear on me. They are, uh, they are they've had about enough with the dad and, and dad's had about enough too. So, but they're off at school and they got activities and we're good to go. They're happier too. I mean, they're ready to be amongst their group and uh, let the, uh, the old man uh, go do his business and leave them alone. For sure. Yeah. Old, old man needs to make some goddamn artwork for sure. I got shows coming up. Well, speaking of La Quinta, I was looking on social this week and there's a lot of great stuff going on in South Florida. It was really exciting to see all the different shows going on in the sun and the palm trees and awards. It was great. Yeah. Lots of big shows happening down in South Florida this, mm-hmm. this past weekend. Lots more coming up. People are driving to La Quinta, doing cross mm-hmm. country from uh, one point to the other. It's exciting to see, but does that ever stress you out at all? When you look at, I, I, I did delete uh, Facebook off my phone mm-hmm. and uh, Instagram off my phone. I started seeing all these beautiful paintings and, and works of art that people are creating. And to be honest, it's just starting to stress me out. Yeah, I have my moments. Would I say maybe a month ago? When yeah. when Florida first started, I was where you are with that exactly because I couldn't get to work and I was kind of sitting back and, and and seeing everything else going on. But now I feel like I'm I'm in the game. I, you know, I'm, nice. I'm making the pieces and I'm planning for the next one, which is Houston in, in a month. So I've got this renewed energy about me that is just it's amazing. I mean, it's I just, can it's see amazing. it. I, know. <laughs> I, can, I can feel it. It's we'll see how the, the editing goes, but I have cut you off a few times already this no. morning because oh, I'm ready to just to run me? with it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I really, like, this past eight days was supposed to be a big production time for me and having uh, okay. uh, snow days and all this other stuff. I am, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just... It's a lot. You know, you lot. all of a sudden you have a lot going on. And then all of a sudden you take eight days off and you're like, yeah, you're just kind of screwed. Okay. So it just adds the pressure. I'm going away to Baltimore this coming up week next. Oh. Uh, by the time this airs. So that'll be if airs Monday, I'll be leaving on Wednesday to uh, plus one it and sell some jewels and, and go and do whatever they're calling. They, they changed the name of ACC Baltimore, which I oh, they did. Um, yeah, what is it? American Handmade, I believe now. Oh, um, okay. Instead of American cool. Craft Council, now it's the American Handmade show. They're trying to uh, trying to do a little rebranding okay. um, on that one. They have the last couple of years. This is not new news. But anyway, I'm plus wanting it with her. I'm going to go and um, flirt with the ladies and put some jewels on them and, and uh, tell them how lovely they look and see if I can uh, eat my weight in seafood. Baltimore's great this time of year, so it'll be good to have that one back and and head off and and do I the love ACC Baltimore. thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm excited to. Uh, well, I'm excited to see my folks. They're coming up. Oh, you good. ever have people come and like family come hang out in your booth? I've had distant relatives who maybe I hadn't seen since you know maybe high school. You know, like oh, yeah. when that's the time you go to big family gatherings or whatever, and they'll show up. And so let's say thirty years have gone by, and now you're. 40, 50 year olds, and you're just standing yeah. there with your hands in your pocket going, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. What okay, are you supposed great. to talk about? Like, yeah. I haven't seen you since Hill Street Blues. <laughs> That's right. Murphy's <laughs> Law for me, though, is whenever I have one of those folks come by, yeah, it's it's Deadville. 
Like oh. I was, I was crushing it in St. Louis one year sure. and had uh, some of Susie's cousins come by who I, I love. They're great. I love uh-huh. it when they come by. This was the year that Cherry Creek was the week before. So oh. I did Cherry Creek right into St. Louis and I was okay. totally picked over and I had a couple yeah. of pieces like kind of the, uh, the garage sale art fair pieces out, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> you know, not quite my, uh, not quite my a game. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. no offense to you, Bonnie. <laughs> but uh, that's what that show's for, right? You right. Know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Well, I always feel like when those slow moments happen and the relatives come, I think to myself, I hope they don't think it's like this all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hope they oh, think yeah. we're like actually, you know, know what it's actually like when we're really busy and, and rocking yeah. it, you know? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's I feel like also, I mean, it's nice for relatives to come see you at a really good show. But typically, mm-hmm. I feel like the relatives are always coming to see you when you're at the, like, the hearing aid festival in the Cracker Barrel parking lot, slumming there it for go. the weekend in between A and B. You know? <laughs> it's like, sure. ah, this is this is what you do. This is how. <laughs> Not to belittle the hearing aid festival in the nope, Cracker Barrel parking lot. Very good show. Very. Oh, good show. just you can really just move some mm. trinkets. That doesn't exist. Speaking by the way. about South Florida and shows coming up, uh, I think this. Is, I don't know. I'm not sure where we're at with timing, but I think. Next week is the big Gasparilla show, and I am so excited to see Michelle Martis's work plastered everywhere on social media and all over the place. That it's just exciting. It's exciting. She's to having see a, a moment. Yeah, yeah, for sure. She's she's having herself a little moment right there. Her work is has has kind of transitioned over the last like I don't know four or five years, and she's in this kind of sweet spot pocket. Yeah, that, uh, she's just kind of crushing it right now, and I think that's a it's a terrific image for the poster. And she's a good friend of, of both of ours, and man, really happy for for her, and and uh, really cool to see. I love seeing that. I love seeing friends work get so much publicity like that and be used that way. So it's awesome. She's so. having a great moment. It is well well deserved. I'm looking at her schedule though, and and she hasn't been to to Fort Worth before. I don't think she was telling me. Oh, wow. she's got Fort Worth on her schedule, and I'm like. You better get ready. Get like, ready. You better get ready. Load it up. Load her up. I'm having a bit of a moment here out in the studio and getting back to work and blowing glass and just feeling on top of the world. And then I see the casting call for Blown Away has come up again. Oh, are you gonna are you gonna try that out again? So we're working in the studio and I say to Renee, So Renee, what do you think? Casting call season four, blown away. She gave me a little bit of the side eye and she's like haven't we like had enough for the last year? Can can we just like get back to kind of normal? I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I'm with her on that. So I, I got to ask you something. Yeah. I told, uh, I was telling Susie about that because you, you sent me a list of topics that you wanted to talk about. And typically yeah. just like a keyword, here's, yeah. here's what, uh, you know. So I looked at the list and it was like casting call for blown away. And I was like, huh, I wonder if he's going to do that again. And, and uh, her question was why? Why would he Why? want to do that? Yeah. What's the, uh, is it the prestige? Is it the notoriety? Is it fame? Uh, like what's I the... guess where it comes down to is I have been a fan of Survivor since it started like 20 mm. some years ago. I had honestly thought when I was younger that that would be something that I might want to do. And sure. this seems to be a reality show like in in my wheelhouse. You know, it's a fantasy. It isn't something I would really want to do because when you think of the logistics, time out of the studio, time away from our career, basically, to possibly embarrass myself on TV, on national yeah. exposure. Uh, no, it's it's bad. And the other thing is they're not really looking for it to be a real competition. I mean, okay. they're casting characters. Well, you're a character. I'm a character. I realize that. But the reality of the show is they've got people on there who've been blowing glass for less than a year. You know, they're not really casting a competition of like like for Top Chef, for example, where they're they're trying to to get them the the best quality chefs and see who can be the best one at the end. They've got like a handful of people who have this long experience in working with glass 
and then they've got a bunch of newbies. So it, it, it isn't real. I mean, nothing on in entertainment is technically real. So yeah, that's funny that you say that. I've got a good friend um, that did Top Chef and then oh. Iron Chef. Uh, after that, uh, cool. she was she's an amazing chef in Richmond, Brittany Anderson. She's a good friend, but she did the first round. They were like far and away. The, you you win this competition if you'd remembered to plate five plates instead of four. But she just oh. she had a brain fart and plated oh. four instead of five. But it was they were like, well, this is head and shoulders above all of the rest of the food, but we can't let you win. You didn't even you know one of us is hungry. Oh, so she got screwed there. Uh, but it was was that an elimination her. for her then because of that? Oh yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it was the final. I think that she, that was the final. And but she was good enough to make it then again onto Iron Chef, and um, has done a lot of the reality things. But has a couple of restaurants in in Richmond, Virginia, Metzger's, which is where my folks go. Treat them real well. And Brenner okay. Pass. It's another one. If you're ever going through Richmond, those are your your spots to get your reservations. Nice. That's it. Nice. You know, that's an interesting topic. Sure. Talking about shows and and um, where to go. And one of my favorite huh. things to do. We were talking to Amy Flynn a couple of weeks ago, you were, and she was talking about the social aspect of it. Yeah. One of my top things that I do is look forward to the restaurants. I'm like, oh, man, I get to eat at – there's like a, a crab cake just dive bar in Baltimore that we go to. We're going to cool. hit called Pete's that Pete's. Um, I'm excited to go to Pete's. You know, it's right next to the hotel. And we're like, you want to just get a crab cake and a beer? My wife is like – absolutely like yeah that's, that's you know that's, that's, that's doesn't need any persuasion on that one it's, no. a, it's a yes <laughs> yeah i mean are you excited about do you guys get excited about that kind of stuff as far as uh, traveling goes and and your favorite spots or, or your favorite little carrots along the way yeah uh not so much the food i mean we're definitely foodies we like we like eating in good places are you yeah, we like we like good food. I mean, I worked at a fine dining restaurant, and so I, I was spoiled for many years. You know, having very very nice nice food. I mean, ultimately, we don't always like to to spend the money on a fifty dollar plate or something. But um, yeah, no, sure. I, I do. Yeah, no, I just I, it's interesting because I I sometimes if you've spent a lot of time in. I don't know. In fine dining kind of kind of situation, sometimes you can kind of see through it. So I'm oh, a mm -hmm. lot of times I'll be like. You know, four stars can be for me uh, or four or five. It can be the dive bar with a crab cake or it can be like the I don't really want the tablecloth and the, I, don't, sure. I don't want the drizzle on the plate. I don't want the oh, on the yeah. side of the plate. You know, the hey, look, it's the red dots. I don't You're reminding it. me of the of the movie called The Menu that was on HBO. Have oh, you yeah. seen it where it goes sinister? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? We did just watch that. I hated that. You hated it? Okay. Oh, I thought it was so dumb. It looked like it was like Scooby Doo. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think that. But I, that's interesting. You say that. What I did jive with is the. Did you see the whole thing, or did you like cut? Yeah, out we of it? watched you the whole thing. I thought. Yeah, I really hated it. Well, what I did like is the commentary on how these wealthy foodies can kind of like manipulate what gets made for them like they want this narrative and i thought this is kind of sounding parallel to the art show world okay. where where we get pushed to doing the obscure thing to appeal to the the heightened sensibilities of art collectors you know <laughs> interesting interesting you so you thought of it more of like um Trying to solve the foodie uh, palette as opposed to uh, trying to solve the art artistic buyer's mind. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, they, they want to be like the buyers, the collectors, the the, the restaurant goers. They want to be special. They want the 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 food that's been whipped into a foam and has no flavor, but you, you know, you can create this narrative about it and make them feel good about themselves that they are so special. You know what I'm saying? And it's sometimes the more approachable hamburger or the hamburger. If we had the correlation to artwork that we sell on the street or that we make, you know what I mean? That there's yeah. like, that's looked down on. Well, that's you know? funny. Yeah. I, in my problem that I had, it's like, okay, they were trying to decide it was like a murder thing and they're trying to mm. kill off all of the guests at this fancy restaurant. And the chef has had enough with all of his clientele. And it's like I, it lost me when it's like the girl goes, well, I went to Brown on a scholarship. And they're like, well, you deserve to die. I'm like, well, wait a minute. My <laughs> nephew goes to Brown. 
<laughs> he doesn't deserve to die. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. I honestly, it did get a little, yeah, a little over the top for sure. <laughs> I don't know. I, I got the metaphor right away, and then they started hammering the metaphor in, and it just seemed really one dimensional. Well, you're not alone with that. Uh, my wife was the same. She's like, yeah, you know, I'm out. This movie is for you to finish. I'm, I'm gonna go read a book or something. So. <laughs> right. And well, you and Renee are in the same boat on that one. Yeah, about ninety. <laughs> I'd say eighty five to 90 percent of the entertainment that like my wife and i totally jive on but she kind of yep. leaned over to me in the middle of that one was like i think this might be dumb what? the whispering i'm guessing you were in the theater because i, I don't think you whisper in your living room do you? yeah we didn't want to wake the dog <laughs> didn't want to want to wake him we have to play with him again he's only two so here's i'm going to totally change the subject on you um yeah. and and give a heartfelt sympathies and empathy and uh, whatever out there to jeweler on the circuit, Hannah Long. What happened? I don't know anything about Hannah this. Long over the weekend after Coconut Grove had her car broken into and her entire jewelry bag taken. Um, oh, my God. Just, I mean, it's the worst nightmare that you can really come up with. The beginning of show season and all of her jewels uh, taken just uh and she's a fairly high end jeweler as well. So breaks my heart. Breaks, breaks my, my heart. heart. I mean, nobody's doing that to us. Like, I just can't like it just it's a punch in the stomach because it happened to two dear friends out in Portland a few years back. Um, oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Janine. And I Janine apologize. And... I'm going to butcher your last name. But at this point, I've had so much coffee. I'd butcher my own Decrescenzo and uh, mm. Megan Clark happened to them, had yeah. both of their jewelry taken at the same time. Uh, when they made a quick stop, they must have been followed and they popped their right. the, the jewelry bags were in the trunk, locked in the trunk. They went into a shop. Boom. Taken. Gone. And so that happened to hand along over the weekend. Folks, I don't know what we're going to have to do, but watch out for each other. We really need to like be sure our jewelers are safe. I don't know how to suggest not to get hit. I, people are targeting, yeah. you know, people are getting targeted. And but just if you can, I guess just watch out for each other. Be kind and and um. I know there's a there. I think there's a GoFundMe happening, maybe, or um, okay. I'm not sure what kind of insurance. But there is a GoFundMe set up by uh, our friend Betty Yeager. Set one up for Hannah, uh, so I will put that link in the episode notes. So be sure to check that out. I my heart goes out to to her. And if there's anything we can do as an artist community to to help her and and our other jeweler friends who are on the lookout, I mean, let's let's kind of band together and do what we can do. That's all. Can I, I hold can your really bag do. while you go take a dump? Okay, it's just been confirmed that this is not an AI version of Will that I'm uh, speaking to right now. This is the real <laughs> Will a, has entered the. It's analog, baby. It's it's <laughs> me. It's the real deal. All right. So, well, we've got Trey Taylor's part two this week. We get into it with the uh, Selma and and George Floyd and mm -hmm. uh, the history of racism in this country. It's and good talk. It's heavy. Gets a little heavy. Get it's into heavy. heart. Did heart attacks and mm -hmm. that can make you, um, especially men. I found, yeah. uh, I've known a lot of men that have had heart attacks now, and it seems like it really affects you. It really yeah. affects your like emotional. Uh, you know, you, you you've seen the other side almost, and it makes you makes you pretty emotional. So, but the tough story and him bringing out the silver lining and all of it that was for me the takeaway because I'm feeling my own sense of silver linings coming about, and I. I think that even though we do get into these hard topics about race and mortality, that at the end of the talk, people are going to feel pretty inspired and ready to ready to create and get out there. Here is Trey and Helene Taylor from Selma, Alabama. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap, the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. So, Will, it's that time of year again when we all need to start getting stuff ready for taxes. Uh. Thanks for that, Douglas. I appreciate that. We all do, quite literally. I did get an email recently from Zap. Uh, they were talking about uh, doing line items and keeping everything together in one place. Yeah, that's right. I tried it out for myself. So when I was logged into Zap, I went to my profile, 
And one of the options further down the page is to download your transaction history. Amazing. That's after you've proven to them that you're not a robot by uh, <laughs> correctly <laughs> identify the tractor before you play that lovely game. So once you've identified that you're an actual human, it's super easy just to select your date range and then it will create a report of all your purchases so you can hand off those booth fees and application fees directly to your accountant. So you're floundering around in the woods and you've had to relieve yourself all over yourself in the middle of the woods and you're seeing snakes and you've gone through hell. What made you want to do it the second time? Ah, well, because Dante went to the Inferno, but he also went to Paradiso. And so yeah. I wanted to see what that's like. So I thought, of got to go back and do it again. So in 98, I went back. That time it was just before I discovered art. And so I put together this kind of trip and went back to the ethnobotanical garden called Sachamama. So I made arrangements for another, uh, this time a different curandero. And this time, and I actually even said, look, the first time was just terrible. And I said, if, if you can, I'd really prefer not to have to go through that experience <laughs> again. All right. So we start off, we drink the tea, and then this was a little bit milder. He might have kind of like, oh, okay, this guy, we better give him half the dose. But <laughs> the thing I remember most about was hearing all those characters from the Looney Tunes. Mm. It was really just a, a kind of like animation. I don't remember any visuals as much as just hearing things. Um, wow. A lot of hearing hallucination type of things. And it wasn't unpleasant. It wasn't a profound experience. But what was interesting is that when I went back, I had an anthropologist friend of mine and I told him the experience. He says, well, that's really interesting. You know, and I don't know if this is true. He says, but Walt Disney was with Maria Sabina. Uh, this may be an mm -hmm. urban myth. And that's where the mouse came to him. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, you know, I, I, I firmly believe in Mark Twain's never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Right, so it's it's true as far as we are concerned, right? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So one of the things that I've read about ayahuasca, and I have not experienced any anything like this, I've, I've, I've not done it, but it has been known to help people form new paths between yeah. certain things. So, for example, if I am I'm going through a, a hard day and my first reaction is to go to a, you know, pour myself a nice whiskey at the end of a, a long, hard day, and then that becomes a problem and then you a crutch and then mm. you start relying on mm. that, it has been known to help people find different paths around that or through it or or be even outside of yourself and recognize that crutch or that path is that yeah i, I think that's a great description of the tools that ayahuasca can be used as there is a, a center in uh, in peru i can't remember exactly where but it's in the amazon basin and they basically take people who have addiction problems, although they can be for a lot of different things, and they mm -hmm. will have them for a week spend time in the hut by themselves. They'll bring them their food and then they'll leave, but they'll be doing ayahuasca on their own. The whole time? Yeah. Usually, I think it's at night when they're, those rituals are administered, but during the day, you know, they're to process what happened the night before. And okay. it does, it is, it, it causes, I mean, if you call it a paradigm shift, it does. It, it, I like the way you described it. It sort of remaps the brain in some way. And th this is, again, just things that I've read and sure. heard about. So it, it has a lot of great potential to do, to awaken it's, people. Uh, yeah, really, and I almost think it, like a tool. Right? You know, I think... Like yeah, I mean, there's such a problem out there with it being sort of a, a, a entertainment, like people are seeking for entertainment. And so there's yeah. a big problem with that. And then that gets into the whole thing about set and setting. And 
but if it's done in the right way, then people come to face themselves. You know, that's, I think, the beauty of these things is you come face to face with yourself. There's no right. more running away from it, you know? Yeah, and I think a lot of people taking it as an entertainment are trying to, I mean, uh, that just goes with a lot of drugs or alcohol yeah. or anything trying to escape something. Mm -hmm. Whereas this seems to be, when used the right way, a way to face an unavoidable, uh, maybe, truth, if that's yeah. right, if that yeah. makes Yeah, I, it's, um, off base. it's ironic because you're, dealing with hallucinations and yet you're dealing somehow about the truth of yourself. I mean, it's a weird kind of combination of things that hard to even comprehend until you've done it, you know? Right. So you experienced both of those ceremonies and they were completely different uh, for you, but did you wake up from the second one with a similar feeling? You know, it wasn't as memorable as that first yeah. one. But I do remember after the experience coming back to San Diego and within a couple of months, so that would have been in August and on January 9th, I made my first painting. Yeah. I often think there was a clearing out. Yeah, there's, this is kind of interesting. Um, I, I remember... Before going down, I used to do a lot of meditating. And I remember I had this kind of thing I'd sit at, and it was a little altar I'd made. I remember having this experience where, as if I were watching TV, and I remember these doors opening and these two hands coming out holding a golden ball. I never really thought too much about it, but... But when I look back on it, I, I, I think, and it was real close to all of what this was happening. I can't remember if it was after yeah. the ayahuasca, but it was, you know, there was this just series of these little, what seemed to be unconnected events. Yeah. And then, then discovering painting. And this was kind of a, a vision that you yeah. had? Yeah. Like, uh, but it, 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 while you're asleep? Meditating. Or, no. While, yeah, meditating yeah. vision. Gotcha. And, and, gotcha. and it was... That's about the only vision I can ever recall if I ever even had it. But that one was yeah. so distinct. It was almost as if something's going to be given to you and it's coming. Yeah. You know? Brace yourself. <laughs> Here yeah. it comes. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I went back to Japan as an artist. It was after I quit my job. I went back to Japan as an artist. But before I went back, I left San Diego and I was in Birmingham where my family was living. And I thought, I'm going to run down to New Orleans and try to get some art in a gallery before I head to Japan. So I went down, yeah. I went to New Orleans, I met this uh, owner of a folk art gallery. He said, you know, I like your art, but I only deal in African-American and Haitian art. And I said, well, uh, I understand. I said, uh, where are the folk artists of this area? I'd like to meet them. He said, they're all dead, but I'll tell you where you can go see their art. He says, there's the Treme Muller African American Museum of Folk Art, and then there's the New Orleans Museum of Art. Well, I had made it a, a one-day trip, and I, w I wasn't going to have time to do both of them. And I thought that first one sounds interesting, but it's going to be too hard to find, so how do I get to the museum? So he tells me, and I'm driving, and about 15 minutes later, I come to a red light on my way to the New Orleans Museum, and I see a tiny little sign. I mean, if I had not stopped, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> right. have seen the sign. It said the Treme Miller African American Museum of Folk Art. Turn left here. So I turn left, and it was just a block down, and I see that it's this raised cottage. It was an old house. And I open the gate, and I go up onto the uh, porch, and I read about the, the museum. It's a little plaque. Right. And then on the right side of the door was the history. Uh, the, the, you know how historical homes have names, uh, these plaques? Right. Absolutely. And so I read, it was something, Gold, Goldthwaite House. And now my memory is failing me. I'm going to just call it the Treme Miller Goldthwaite House. It wasn't actually that, but Goldthwaite was in the title. Yeah. And so I, I was like, God, that sounds so familiar. 
what the hell is it? <laughs> so let me just walk off the porch and see what I'm looking at. I walk off the porch, turn around, and then finally I realize I'm staring at the house my, my mother grew up in that my grandmother owned. Oh, my God. That's, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. So at yeah. that point, and how long? I mean, at that point, how long had it been since you had been back? Oh, I. So my mother had. When she grew up, obviously in yeah. New Orleans, and she used to take us when you know when we were kids to show us these houses that she grew up yeah. in. And so I had visited that house years before. I think it was abandoned, and we walked around in the courtyard and just you know, and and then I realized leaving biochemistry. And taking on this crazy idea of, well, I'm, I love painting so much, I'll just, just I'm prepared to starve if I have to, right? <laughs> but that was right. a confirmation for me that this choice was much bigger than just making the decision, well, I think I'll, you know, it, it was yeah. driven by some kind of, I don't know, it's a very it's a strange thing. It is, There's, but it's connected, right? I mean, that's the whole connected. connection. You it's know, everything... Has, it has had a, a thread. Yeah, and it was it actually gave me the confidence to to know that okay, this is this is a journey, and uh, get on this magic carpet and ride it, and do not look back. You know. Yeah. And it has been that. I mean, just the stories. I wish we had a lot of time. I tell you some just incredible <laughs> stories. That's why I'm here. Yeah. So Trey and Helene, you live in kind of a hotbed of civil rights history and really just the deep south. You're there in Selma, Alabama. And when George Floyd was murdered and, and the community kind of exploded and the world caught on fire, you guys reacted to that how could you not but i feel like it started off almost with like a facebook group of like what do we even do to some actual action and i wanted to talk to you guys about your experience there in selma and kind of the community outreach that you you've done together to bring people together positively so if you could talk to me a little bit about that i'd, I'd love to, to hear more well so trey did design and schedule a mural as a reaction to the George Floyd murder. And we did it on a pretty large wall um, in Selma. And we partnered with the police and the sheriff department. Oh, wow. And the idea was, we as artists, I mean, what can we do is what your question was. And right. I think one thing that we do and we can do is bring people together. And art is a fantastic bridge for that. It, you know, it, all ages, all abilities can come to the wall, literally, and, and make art together. And so the mural was designed, it's called Coming Together. And the very first person to put paint on the wall was the sheriff. Oh, my and, gosh. You know, of course, he was doing it as public relations. And the perpetrator of Bloody Sunday was a sheriff of course, not this sheriff. And so that one stroke to me was huge. And we handed out stickers to kids, you know, like badges for police and, and the sheriff department. And it happened to be at the time where Merrill race was happening. So a lot of candidates came and painted mm. and brought their people. And it was just a beautiful experience. And then we usually do the murals just for the weekend. And it was probably sure. pretty late on Saturday afternoon where we were like, oh, we should do a closing ceremony. And so I literally like took a piece of cardboard and painted closing ceremony Sunday, two o'clock, four o'clock, whatever it was. Yeah. And I do keep a list of all the people that participate in the mural or we do because we write their names in the murals, which oh, is, nice. you know, it's part of the part of the artwork. Is part of the artwork. So, and I have this whole list of everybody that that participated, and it was a little bit over a hundred people. And the mural told a story about how the people come from the east and the west, and they come to Queen Selma. Selma is called the Queen City of the Black Belt. So, we created a character named Queen Selma that Trey fashioned after a healer here. 
Yeah. And the, the mural told the story of people coming from the east and the west and bringing flowers, which she released in the river to restore the dignity of all. So we used magnolias, which are the symbol of dignity. And, you know, I talk about a magic that happens at the wall, and often the story that we're painting comes alive. And that is exactly what happened. And so we decided we'll have this closing ceremony and we'll all throw flowers into the river together. Well, like I said, just a little over 100 people participated on the wall painting and 65 people came back on that Sunday which mm. I'm always saying, where do you get 65% participation? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Spur of the moment. Yeah. But they, these experiences are infectious. And I also think that that showed how much of a need there was for this kind of just joyful celebration and coming together. And people brought flowers and we made kind of like wreaths out of just the kudzu next to the building. And it was all completely yeah. spontaneous. And we walked to the bridge. You know, we have a pretty famous bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge (laughs) that crosses the Alabama River, which we're new Selma folks. And that Alabama River, it's wild. It looks like the mighty Mississippi, if I've ever seen one. Mm. It's very, very tumultuous. You know, it's it's got serious current. It's dark. They call it the Amazon of the South anyway, or is it the Amazon of the... Of America, it has incredible diversity of fish and birds. Anyway, we we walk up to that bridge. We're singing. This is all completely wow. spontaneous, and we release these flowers into this mighty river. And I cannot tell you personally, my experience was just you know dumbfounded and yeah, and so simple, right? I mean, we as a community came together to paint. That was only our only goal is to paint and hopefully do a little healing. And and that's all we can do as artists to me is just create the access. Uh, right. And I mean, so many of us create our, our things in our studios by ourselves. And um, anyone, it sounds like that, that, that you guys and, and Trey has done all his career, whether it's creating like, you know, a, a Joker kind of piece of artwork on the corner of Japan on trash day or, or getting out there. It's always been kind of a, a, a shared thing. And how do we, how do we do that as artists and bring it out of our studios? And you guys seem to have found some way to, to do that. And that's taken on a, a life of its own all around the entire uh, city of, of Selma, right? Yes, and this whole area, but it's really, it's so simple. You know, I think we overthink things like, yes, oh, we need to do this and we need to do that. And honestly, somebody said, well, you can paint it on our building. And we're like, okay. And then somebody said, nice. you know, I'll, I, I'll call the sheriff and we're like, okay. And, you know, it, they have their own energy. And actually, it's one of the things we've learned through this whole project that Trey's done called The Revolution of Joy. We've done nine murals through the Black Belt. And sometimes there's too many speed bumps or or turns okay. in the maze. And we've realized like if that if that's happening, if there's these bulkheads happening, then it's not going the right direction. Okay. And you know, you really have to kind of, you know, go with the flow or whatever. But if you know, yeah. really follow how the community is um is working it. You know, if that wall is too complicated, like there's issues, uh, right. say it's on a busy street or say this organization doesn't want to work at that wall because of this person and blah, 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 or stuff like that. Right. Then we realize, oh, well, that's not, then it's not supposed to be there. You know, these that kinds seems of things. like a really clear way to look at it. I was going to ask you and, and, you know, this, this question may have a lot more to do with me than it does with you, but uh, what kind of, are you running into any kind of cynicism with that or has it all been joy? We've had one particular critic, what we were doing. She's a well-known activist yeah. and she's done some amazing things. She and her husband, I mean, the day that I met her, they were speaking for the Doug Jones campaign, which is Democrat senator that was running and they've done some really great things. But what I learned was activists have a really important part 
in our role and our history of moving forward. But they're fighters and they yeah. they have to fight. And we are community builders. So we put all that aside and invite everyone. Right. Peace was actually happening at the wall. Yes. But they couldn't see it. They could only see what was not there. And they were great teachers. That, that was a great teaching ex experience for us. And, you know, out of nine murals, if we've had one critic, and it didn't change anything. No. It was just, you know, oh. Right. And it was about inclusion. You know, it was about inclusion. And I think we do the best we can to be as completely inclusive of the populations that we're working in. Selma is 80% African American and we really respect that. We really right. Well, it's try interesting. Our best. Yeah, that you say that if you've read there's an incredible graphic novel series called March um that talks about a lot about Selma and they run into some of the same kind of roadblocks where you guys are running into that where it's like hey we're trying to be super inclusive and some people don't want to be necessarily inclusive it's like well I th this person is the person that I'm I've been arguing with for mm -hmm. the last you know however many years but the project that you guys are doing and and uh, I really admire where it is can you tell me where where are some of the the other murals that have gone up you know we just moved to Selma in December of 2020 and okay. before that Trey had already started this project which is called the revolution of joy which the project design is 20 murals across the black belt mm. And the Black Belt is this region of the middle of Alabama is where the cotton grew. And that's why it's called the Black Belt, really, because of the soil. And it's a band, you know, okay. probably Delta soil. I'm not sure. And there's 11 counties in the Black Belt and nine are considered the poorest in the nation. Okay. So it's a very impoverished area. So we were already here doing that project. And that's kind of the reason that we moved to Selma because we didn't want to be outside coming in, but versus part of the community. Right. It's easier to be inclusive if you know your neighbors. Yeah, and, you if you know. know who you're including. Yes, yes. So it just made sense for us at the time of our lives and, and, and for this project. So we centered ourselves in community arts by moving to Selma. On purpose. Um, on purpose. Yeah. So there's only... We've only done two Revolution of Joy murals in Selma, another community mural we did with partnering with the city and the schools. But there's other ones in Marion, Alabama, uh, Camden, Alabama, Utah, Alabama, Greensboro, mm. and Greenville. Mm. Wow. And then this, this year, we'll do one in Orville and one in hopefully Demopolis. Um, wow. And really, and, I mean, intentionally tracing these steps of, of like civil rights and, and the movement of, of civil rights or, or no, is this just happenstance because of the South and Alabama? Oh, yeah, that's just happens, happenstance. Yeah. That particular mural that you talked about that was really, you know, right when we were moving to Selma was intentionally to to discuss the race issues and the unrest that was nationwide. Right. But of course, Selma is the the center of a lot of that um, healing and, you know, a lot of the uh, injustices. But most of our murals are not about, are not socially minded like that. They're much sure. more about something. Trey writes a little legend that has to do with joy inspired by a unsung hero of that area. But we definitely want to bring economic development through the arts to this poor area of the South. I think that's more of our drive than the actual civil rights trail, yeah. just to be inspired. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what we're The inspiration by, of, 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 of mm. creativity, really. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. Just thinking about the, the history of that area. You can't help but but land on places of historical significance, even if you're not intending to. Uh, going down to Mississippi and being a, a walking cliche of the 50 year old white man that loves the blues, and walking around and and going uh, to different areas. I went down and and saw, and I've I've mentioned this before, but going down and seeing the different grave sites of Robert Johnson. 
mm-hmm. and unintentionally finding myself on an Emmett Till trail, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm looking up and right. I'm like, oh, it's like, well, maybe maybe Robert Johnson stopped here and got a Coke. And you're like, well, guess who else got a Coke here? And you re- read the placard and it's it, it does open your eyes to this country and the history of, of what's happened and, and what is happening here. And I applaud you guys for for stepping into that and and trying to create a community within uh, history and community within. uh, Well, it's the, it's the revolution of joy. So it's about the future. It's about hope. It's about community now moving forward. Right. So, you know, you can't be here without honoring and respecting and learning of the injustices right. that continue. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and I think one of the first questions you ask is what can you do as artist? And that can be extremely daunting. And it's especially daunting right now because we're uh, recovering from this tornado and, you know, we're a poor community when we've just been wiped out. It's yeah. just amazing. So what do you do? Well, our, you know, we had a little meeting of creative minds just, just Saturday night. It's like, okay, we're going to make rebel art. Let's do it. You know, people need healing. Right. And we need to come together and we need, and no one died. And that's what we need to celebrate. And we need to celebrate loss. I think that Selma helped us align our purpose. Like Trey, there's all this conversations about looking for your purpose or looking for the truth. And Selma is just an, an instant opportunity for aligning your purpose with your job. (laughs) Right. Exactly. With your job. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're lucky, you know, then you get to do that. And we, if you're lucky, we, yes. You guys do. Or you guys got nailed by that tornado. Like, what, what was the path uh, as far as Selma goes? Just, you know, I know a lot of people know about it, but just what was your experience and, and where did that land? Well, I'll let Trey talk a little bit more about the experience because I was actually out of town, okay. which was a good thing. I was just yeah. up in Birmingham, which is just an hour and a half away. So when it we hit got hit, I could go get a generator and flashlights and anything else I could think nice. about, think of. But um, we are we were in the path. Our house is hit by a tornado. Mm. We consider ourselves the lucky ones. We only lost chimneys and trees and a few windows. Mm. You know, of course, roof damage, but the house next door lost its roof and the house next door has its roof. And then the next house doesn't have a roof. So tornadoes are crazy. Nuts. They nuts. hop. We've learned a lot more about tornadoes than we've ever wanted to know. But our town has a wide swath of the route, which is truly unbelievable and that's you can't you can stand in front of it you can stand in front of the debris in the house or the there was with a house and you can't understand it yeah it's super heartbreaking <laughs> yeah i'm sorry to um, make you but you know the it. yeah but one thing about tornadoes there's a path on the left side of the path and the right side of the path are still fine so mm. you can still go to a bank and you can still go to your grocery store and you can still get gas. I mean, I didn't know what to expect as I was coming in. So I was filling up gas tanks coming in town. I was like, am I going to be able to get gas for a generator? I don't know, you know? Yeah. So I've learned a lot more about natural disasters. Than you ever wanted to. Yeah. Our town is really going to suffer. I can't, I just, we're just at week three. It's total chaos. And I'm so sorry. Super, super, super sad. Yeah. Thank you. What can uh, anybody do to help? Is there anything that, that, that people can do to help? Is do you guys is this a Red Cross kind of situation or are we um, are there Yeah, we have that- everybody. We have Red Cross and FEMA. It got a lot of resources and I think pe- the people's immediate needs lo- appear to me to be taken care of. Like okay. Trees are off of houses, streets are cleared and power is restored. But we lost a lot of housing. Yeah. So what's that going to look like? I drove through one of the worst hit neighborhoods today to show a friend and they're a neighborhood. I hope that small houses are rebuilt instead of, you know, large low income housing compounds. You know, right. I, want, I hope our neighborhoods return. So I think what we need is investment. And if you <laughs> have that capability, there's a lot of ways to invest with historic 
what's it called? Historic credits? Historic, Historic tax, tax credits. credits. Yeah. So it's it's just what we really really need is economic support in this in Selma. It doesn't need Selma is our nation's town. It right. holds a lot of history and it needs to be supported by the nation. Right. And the way to support it is to, you know, invest in Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I just I it breaks my heart because you think about all of the, the the different black communities that have been uh neglected whether it's it's um in Michigan or or Jackson, Mississippi or Tennessee and it's going to take a lot of work for sure. I applaud you guys for doing what you can really i i don't know what else to say as far as that goes it's almost like you don't really have a choice though right well you just that's right we, if we all do what we can though that's yeah, a lot we absolutely do what you can absolutely you know and also there's an open invitation to any artist who wants to come and share their gifts with selma we do have a really old big house that was spared by the tornado and we would love people to come yeah and stay here and and share their gifts with Selma. These children, they they need dance and drama and drawing and all of it. All the Absolutely. arts. Um, yeah. Storytelling. You guys have a house, your house there in Birdland. And it's, it's a little bit Birdland. of a, a gallery and almost like a, a, just a, a, a joining space, if you would, I, the way I see you guys there on, on Instagram. or Yeah, we would love for it to be, you know, cooperative. We have a garden and we can pick vegetables and cook our dinner and you know i hope that other people will come and just see selma come see it come see Definitely. it and share it share your gifts with amazing. us. amazing i appreciate that so much thank you helene right. and um i might grab trey yes. on to close out a couple of our other things that we were talking about i wanted to to, to touch on this and, and part of your your thread too and the fact that you've been pretty open to experience you experienced a heart attack not too long ago, and, and our community almost lost you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that and, and how that makes you feel kind of on the other side. I know uh, you've always led your lived your life with, with a lot of gratitude, but mm -hmm. how does that dictate your, you going forward? So it's an interest, that's been an interesting experience. That happened in 2020, two weeks before we moved out of the house yeah. to Selma. And I remember, I always tell people, the house, when we came down December 1st, we opened the doors, and it's, there's nothing, of course, inside the house. And we're both standing there with tears in our eyes. She's got tears of joy. I've got tears of fear. Like, <laughs> oh, my God, what have we done? <laughs> so much and work. So, yeah. And, and so I... I'm the kind of person who uh, believes that the body can heal itself and, you know, try to not use too much medicine, Western medicine, if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not opposed to it. But now I'm given like eight pills. <laughs> you know, in the beginning, right. it was very hard because I couldn't walk across the room without being tired. Yeah. So I had to kind of rehabilitate myself. And I, I did. I went through this cardio this cardiac rehab, but I also did my own rehab here. So we have two sets of stairs, and it was in the middle of winter, and so I didn't want to go walking outside, so I would walk up the steps, go down through the hall and down the steps. I would walk four miles oh, in the God. house just to rehab, yeah. you know, and that really helped. That, that I, you know, the first thing you experience is you can't believe it's happening, but then you realize you just survived it and it, what i had was called the widow maker and i had what's called 99 percent occlusion mm. so my and we were out hiking oh my god we were hiking and uh the strangest part about that story is i guess i had bronchitis and i was coughing and helene said do you want to turn around i said no no let's go on up to the top of this and get the view and so I made it to the top, and we were sitting there, and it was so beautiful and peaceful. And I had this just strange thought that this is so peaceful, so lovely, so beautiful. This wouldn't be a bad place to die. Oh, my God. I had that thought. Yeah. And I actually, there was a fence around a fire tower. This was a place we used to come, I used to come to when I was a kid. We'd go camping. I just wanted to go and revisit this thing. I hadn't seen it yeah. in probably 50 years. 
And so there was this fire tower and I wanted to go climb it. Well, you'd, I would have had to jump over the fence to get up, you know, to do it. And I had considered and I thought, you know, I'm not going to do it. Well, five minutes later, I'm walking down and having this terrible, oh. this like, it felt like it wasn't in the chest. It was in the arms. And uh, it was as if like things were running up and down my inside my, my veins or something. And I turned around and I'm waving at Helene. And she, oh, no. she didn't understand. <laughs> She's waving at me. <laughs> and so she came down. I, I thought, I'm going to lay down on the ground and just run my arms. I still had no idea what was going on. And as soon as I laid down, I thought, oh, no. Now, whatever this is, we need to get to wow. the car. And of course, we got oh, to you, the car, and then she had the four. You made it back then. How, how far out were you? We were 30 minutes from the ER. It took 30 minutes. But she wow. stopped. She had the foresight. There was a, a gas station on the way. She had the foresight to stop and get some aspirin like she's thinking just in oh, yeah. case this is a and that bought me time you know yeah she and, saved your life yeah there's some there's some weird stories that come with this little incident we sold our house to a uh, a couple that came down from new york and a year later a beautiful couple i mean he and i were starting to know each other he was a drummer and she was a dancer mm, nice he has a heart attack in my old bedroom mm. a year later and that threw me into depression did it really like, yeah i couldn't understand that's where things began to come come up and i thought okay this is just too weird why why did i survive you know why did i had 30 minutes and i survived you know it was just that right. kind of like it was just that that really threw me over the edge. And all yeah. summer, um, it was in 2021, summer 2021, I just could not get out of this just terrible thought of like, you know, you start to really understand your mortality. I don't well, that's know wh what I've come across with, with friends who have had heart attacks, too, yeah. is that they're a lot more, they have, they have seen mortality they have seen you know the end almost and yeah you know they are a lot more appreciative but also a lot more emotional you know right uh, I, have you experienced some of that too just yeah. being more yeah i remember in the beginning i was so just 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 gratitude for like just for every minute that you're alive you're thinking you know there's just so much to be thankful for and of course life gets back to the way it is you know sure. and uh, this will be now Two years since it happened, I was fearful then. So you go into gratitude, then you go into fearful. Uh, I had to wear what's called a life chest for a little while. It shocks you. It's, oh, wow. it's triggered based yeah. on, you know, your EKG or something. Well, the damn thing would always go off sometimes. Uh, the warning would go off. Like, I remember I was holding the cat, and the cat tried to jump out of my and it shifted and sent off a warning signal and and i'm sitting there Here and I comes yeah and i couldn't remember how to turn the damn thing off and you're supposed to you know hit the these two buttons at the same time and i'm, I'm gonna have a heart attack I'm trying to figure out how to turn this off uh, here's another little strange synchronicity that has to do with all of this and and that is um so i didn't do chair i actually canceled all these shows uh, in the summer of 2021, you know, I started to get into this fear, this idea of like, mm. God, you know, I, I've got to be careful or I'm going to have another heart attack. And so I started, I just fell into this place of fear. And I remember telling Helene, she came, This we were up at our little house up in the mountains. And I was up there trying to, you know, I was up there painting and so she came up and I said, I've decided I'm not going to do any festivals. I'm, I'm done with the festivals. Hmm. I just, I've, I've got to take care of my health and God knows the festivals yeah. can be so, so stressful. Uh, you know? Yeah, right. Running we, from We tornadoes. know a little bit about that. Yeah. We know a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, and she's, of course, you know, horrified. Like, well, how the hell are we going to support ourselves? And I said, I hadn't figured that out yet, but. And so we have this river across the street, and uh, I said, let's just take a break. 
and let's go for a swim. And so I went into the bathroom and I have this little little vial that I carry. It's uh, nitroglycerin. Uh, and most of the time I remember to bring it with me. Yeah. But in this particular case, I saw it sitting up there and I'm putting it on my bed and I said, oh, I better take this with me. So I put it in my pocket and uh, we go across the street to the river. I jump in and I thought, oh my God, I forgot to take it out. So I, I get out of the water, I take it out and I put it up on the bank. Helene gets in the river and we're just sitting there floating around and all of a sudden she goes, huh, what is this? <laughs> a glass file of nitroglycerin is floating what? down the river with someone else's name on it up to her. And I said, you see, you see, you got to take this seriously. <laughs> that is a sign. Yeah. And she was just freaked out, you know. And I, I bet. Said, and so we went up and I was now feeling really like, okay, I'm really getting off of the, that, that's clearly a sign for both of us. We need to get serious about this. Well, two weeks later, a friend of mine comes up and uh, he was living here in Selma at the time. And he was a wonderful woodworker, but he's also a minister in training or he, he trained at a, he, he trained in a, a theological in, in seminary. Yeah. So that was kind of his, his path was looking to, you know. Right. And so we're sitting there and I'm telling him the story and I said, and I and it just confirmed, you know, I need to get off of this, this thing. And he starts chuckling and he goes, that's not the way I see it. And I said, how do you see it? He says, I see it as I got your back, get back to living. And that was oh, what I needed man. to get out of that fear base. Like, oh my God, I'm looking through the glasses of fear. Yeah. And so I went back to work and three weeks later, I think we were at La Quinta or something like that. But pretty much that whole thing with the heart attack is it is a roller coaster but i sure. i i feel like i've gone through the worst and i guess the best of it all if there is you know yeah i mean and, it's interesting to me that 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 you did get there because that's not how i only know you a little bit and what yeah. that is 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 wide open you know that experience that yeah. that kind of open to living and open to life and mm. i remember we had dinner had plans to come up and and meet and uh it was you and Helene and, and Daryl and uh, Signe and Genna and Susie and I were going around the corner to, to meet where you guys had said to go. And we see you guys leaving. You disappeared and, and kind of took off for about, I don't know, about an hour. And it was just a super casual dinner. But we thought it was right around, you know, that time that we were supposed to meet. Once you did join us, you're like, well, it was really hot. And we had to go sit in the river. <laughs> and it was like, I, it was such a great thing i loved that and it really summed it up to me it's like well this is this is who this is you know yeah. this is who this is what he's all about it's like well they they had to go sit in the river and it's like yeah. well, god damn and since that point we we definitely have had moments where we've just gone and and sat in the river instead of being on time or, you know fuck it who cares yeah, you're well, on time it's like well you you were a much better version of yourself from having gone and sat in the river than you would have been had you not been right that's I mean, so it's like that's that's the kind of living that I aspire uh, to be. So, well, thank I, you. I, you know, it does kind of get us into trouble, and and uh, and I, um, yeah, I remember we had a really good time together that night with all of us. We did, you know, yeah. We and, talked and a lot maybe about, we wouldn't have had such a good time had you not. Who <laughs> knows? Remember, right? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but it's necessary, and uh, yeah. I, I love your your voice, and I love your stories. I love the fact that you're still with us, by God. Thank you, man. Thank uh, you, Will. And, and living wide open still, too. Trying, so, trying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, That's come all. see us in Santa Fe. I, I said this to. I don't know if you heard me say this to to your better half there, but um, if you if there's a chance for a dinner in there with the with the very famous T Bang, uh, if you can yeah. pull him away from. <laughs> yeah, then from, from uh, all the publicity maybe. that he's yeah giving her, <laughs> love to have him on the show, but I don't know if we can get him anymore. <laughs> he's he's too famous now. He is. Uh, uh, well, well I, I love you, buddy. 
I love you too, brother. And I, I look forward to, you know, seeing you. Um, we'll, we'll text you and let you know when we're coming through. Please do. If, if it works out, we'd love to see you. Yeah. You know, I understand it's always a, a time crunch, but we'd love to see you. Sounds great. All right, brother. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with all of us. And, and um, uh, we've got all the pieces and parts, and we'll see what Douglas comes up with. Bless his heart, man. He's got a job ahead. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He's going to kill me. <laughs> all right, brother. Talk to you all soon. Right. Thank you, Will. Bye now. Thank you. Take care. Take care. All right. Well, I'm not going to kill you. That was a really good interview. So uh, <laughs> thanks for talking to Trey and, and Helene. It was a great talk. We had a good time, man. Um, and to be honest, you probably still had to cut 30, 45 minutes of, of technical difficulties and this and that. And I appreciate those guys sticking with us and and uh, giving us a really, really good talk. So I had a lot of fun talking with them and I can't wait to to see both of them and give them a big hug on the road. Yeah, I I, I love the part when she was talking about doing the mural in Selma and how the sheriff stepped up and made the first stroke and they partnered with the sheriff's department because this is the this is the thing that gets to me. This is my issue. When some people have a hard time at looking at the past and just acknowledging the pain. We've talked a lot about empathy on this show and having empathy for somebody's experience and their history is needed. You know, for that sheriff to say, I didn't create the problem years ago, but ceremonially I can act as as a symbol to try and and acknowledge what what was in the past, you know? So I thought that was yeah, really powerful. Absolutely. Yeah, it was very powerful. Uh, great talk and and great work that they're doing down there in Alabama. So you know, it's interesting. We never really talk about appropriation on this show, and I don't know if it's a topic that we want to uh, broach, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard for older white folks to have that empathy to sure. not necessarily or to know where to show it. You mm -hmm. know, like I remember when the the statue of Robert E. Lee which, that I grew up with, mm -hmm. I took my kids down to it and, and people just decided they'd had enough started marking up the statues and be like, you know what? It's time for these to go. And I took my kids down there and, and did a little tour and they thanked me for the lovely tour of the F word. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but it's just, you know, it was, uh, it was interesting to go down there too by myself and see some of that. And as a middle-aged uh, post middle-aged white guy, to be standing out there and looking at it and seeing history take place in front of you. And this was more of a violent kind of, this has to go, we're going to rip it down kind of demonstration as opposed to the more of the, the love and community that those guys were doing. But I'm standing there looking at it like just, wow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some young dude just doing a slow circle around this three-story statue of Robert E. Lee. He's looking up at it, and I'm looking up at it, too. And so as a person of color who's driving the car, he looks up at the statue. He's like, you know, gives the middle finger up in the air. And then he looks at me and sees me and gives me some of that, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and, he, and I'm like, yeah, that's fine, man. I mm -hmm. kind of deserve it, too. You know, history is what history is, and I, I can take some of the shrapnel. Sure. So... It, it's interesting to see uh, this time and to live in any time, but man, hats off to those guys for taking it in a positive place and yes. hats off to the people in Richmond for taking it in the place they did too. It's just, it's a, uh, it's time to grow. It's time to, it time to move on. It is. The other big thing I took out of this talk was his advice or his experience of putting fear behind and moving forward in life you know, hopping on that magic carpet, taking signs from the universe and living this life of of taking risks and taking chances that it's really an encouragement to get back to living. And that's what I'm taking away from this talk. I don't know. This is a risk taking business that yeah. we're all in. You know, right. I mean, we can die in a car wreck. We can jackknife it. You mentioned Martis early on. Mm -hmm. our, our good friend, Michelle Martis, had, a, had one of the more horrific traffic accidents um it's been almost 10 years now right. or, or more on her way somewhere around atlanta i remember hearing about this mm -hmm. but she jackknifed her her truck and trailer you never know when it's going to end so that's i think why we were all chomping at the bit during covid too it's already a matter of risk mm -hmm. uh that we take every day and it's just one more thing that we've got to throw into the thing it's like look 
my jewelry bag can get stolen. I can get in a car wreck. I can break my leg. I can have a heart attack. I Tornado can, can go uh, down the street. I mean, we, the list is endless. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can zero. You can spend mm -hmm. all your money and then take a zero on the chin. So it, it never knows. We're all used to gambling. This is a it's a gambler's business, my it friend. Is. So uh, yeah, all you gamblers out there on the road, thanks for tuning in to the show week after week. And uh, we still are enjoying doing it as long as you continue to enjoy listening to it. And, and thanks again for all your support. We appreciate it. Have good shows, everyone. We'll see you down the road. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, find us on social media and engage in these conversations. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. Oh, and if you like the show, we'd love it if you would give us your five-star rating and offer up your most creative review on your podcast streaming service. See you next time.